This evening, our panelists will be Diane Rosati, Matthew Weintraub, Sergeant Kevin Edwards, Corporal Candace Tremblay, Gretchen Hagenbach, Douglas Olszewski, and Alyssa Martin. Um, and we'll share a little bit more about them later when we get closer to the, the panel uh, portion of the evening, but I wanted to share who they are. So that way, if you'd like to submit questions, you know who to direct them to. And this is the link for you to submit questions. So as we're going through the data, if something pops into your mind that you'd like to learn more about, feel free to go to this link and there will be a, a, a short form for you to submit your questions. You can direct them as a general question or specific to uh, certain individuals on our panel. So before we get into the data, again, I just want to mention what the data is based off of. The data that we'll be covering tonight is based off of the Pennsylvania Youth Survey, which um, was de developed basically by uh, David Hawkins and Richard Catalano of University of Washington. And um, basically what it does is it assesses youth behaviors and it looks at, well, it's available for grades six, eight, 10 and 12, and our district specifically surveys grades 8, 10, and 12, uh, which is actually fa fairly common for um, the state of Pennsylvania. The survey is done in an anonymous and confidential format, and Bach Harrison is the, you know, the state uh, entity that they contract with the, the um, they're contracted to clean the data um, and provide all of the uh, basically the reports back to the districts. And that report is what we've used to combine um, and put together this presentation. A lot of people ask about how we can be sure that the data that we are looking at is valid. Um, you know, it's based off of students' feedback, but there are a number of trigger questions that are embedded into the process. So as students are going through the survey and if they're not answering honestly, it indicates for Bach Harrison to actually pull out that entire set of data. And so that's how we know that our data is very clean, um, that we have good data and uh, truthful responses because the ones that have been triggered as untruthful uh, have been pulled out. And also I like to mention the real numbers. So a lot of the times when you're looking at data and graphs, uh, we can get carried away by just the, the gravity of the graph. Um, it's helpful to, to think about the real numbers. So last year in New Hope Solbury, we had nearly 300 students participate in grades eight, 10, and 12 in the survey. So this chart will help you to think through when you see a percentage, um, what that corresponding number of students might be. You also have to keep in mind when there are questions that are secondary questions. So for instance, if a student indicates that they have, um, for instance, drank alcohol, and then it asks a question related to that question of the, the group of students that have already indica indicated that they've consumed alcohol, then it's a smaller group of students that are being asked the secondary question. So um, that's helpful for us to keep in mind when we look at percentages and when we look at uh, graphs that we don't get carried away, that we don't assume things are, are worse than they are, um, but that we really understand the numbers behind uh, the, the percentages and the graphs. Also, as we're going through tonight, the, the colors should be the same in all of our charts. So the blue uh, columns in our graphs will be representative of 2015 data. The orange will be representative of 2017 data. The green will be 2019 data. And the red is comparative to the state 2019 data. So as we go through, if you're kind of confused at any point, um, use that as a reference, it should help you. Um, basically the current data that we're looking at is, is going to be green and we can compare that to the red, which is the current state data for the 2019 uh, survey. So moving into the actual data portion, we're going to look at alcohol, tobacco and other drug use and access questions. When we look at these um, substances, we like to compare lifetime use and 30 day use. It's a common format for us to um, consider how students are using. And when we compare the two, we're able to see um, whether the, the use is current or whether the use uh, has, appear, has occurred over a period of time. So when a student, uh, or when lifetime use is indicated, it means that a student responded yes to having consumed or used a substance in their lifetime. And that's meant to indicate exposure. 
and 30 day use is a better indicator of current use. And as you see here, we're higher than the state average in basically every category. 50% of the students had consumed alcohol in their lifetime and 22% had used marijuana in the past 30 days. And when we look at the 30 day mark, uh, that's the 30 days prior to them taking the survey, which would have been about this time last year. On this slide, we're looking at vaping and e-cigarette use and it's 30 day use that we're looking at here. It's important to note that vaping is a mechanism for delivering a substance. So um, it's not a specific substance. There can be a variety of substances um, inside of a vape that students or any, anyone is using. So at the time of the survey, 20.9% of our students had used vape or e-cigarette pro products in the past 30 days. And that breaks down to 2.9 of eighth graders 24.3% of 10th graders and 38.6% of 12th graders indicating use. So you can see that um, it's more prevalent in the higher grades and the higher ages, and uh, there's kind of an escalation of use as students mature. Now, as I mentioned, um, vaping is a mechanism, it's a delivery mechanism, and there are a variety of things that could be in a vape. So this looks at really what the substances inside of a vape, or at least what the students perceive the substances inside of their vapes to be. So what's uh, interesting here is that in eighth grade, students have indicated that they thought it was either just flavoring or that they didn't know what they were using. In 10th grade, 80% of students indicated that uh, they were using nicotine. And in 12th grade, 51.3% of students were indicating marijuana or hash oil. So this progression, I think, is evidence that vaping in our community is kind of, it's a mechanism, but also a gradual transition for students to uh, move into harsher substance use. So this chart looks at uh, prescription and over-the-counter drugs and medications. And it's the rates of lifetime use on the left and 30-day use on the right. As you can see, we're slightly higher than the state average in lifetime use of tranquilizers and stimulants and 30-day use of tranquilizers and stimulants as well. Based off of focus groups with students, we're hearing that these numbers are likely related to sharing drugs like Adderall and Ritalin, uh, typically used for ADHD. Um, students have indicated that um, it's more prevalent for students to share drugs like that when there's lots of testing or um, high stress situations in their life and they, they feel as if they need to focus more and students will share those things. But again, I think it's important for us to, to consider the real numbers here, right? These are percentages and they are relatively low. Okay, so this is looking at some other drugs and it's specifically lifetime use. Similarly to prescription drug use, you can see that um, we are higher than the state average when it comes to hallucinogens and synthetic drugs. However, again, with real numbers in our district, 3% is a relatively low number of students. Um, for example, with 3% in hallucinogens, it's really closer to like nine students overall um, who would have answered that question as yes, in their lifetime, they've used hallucinogens. So when we compare this to something like alcohol, for instance, um, where you know approximately 155 students are indicating that they'd had lifetime use of alcohol, it's a, it's a significant difference. Um, so when we're looking at these data points, it's really helpful for us to, to hold them in comparison and really think about the, the actual numbers behind them here. It's also worth mentioning um, synthetic drugs, if you are unfamiliar with them, um, there's a rising number of synthetic marijuanas that are actually uh, available legally over the counter. And you can buy them at convenience stores and gas stations. And the way that that's possible is because every time that um, uh, laws are being made about or against them to prohibit them, um, they can change the chemical makeup of them and basically sell them as a different product. So uh, it's able to stay legal. So that's something to keep in mind. But again, in our district, although it is higher than our state average, um, because we have such a small group of students being uh, surveyed, the number is relatively low of students who have indicated they've actually used. 
Okay, so this is risky substance use related behaviors. And I think at this point, you might be wondering, well, what's the harm in some underage drinking or a little marijuana use? And on that note, uh, I like to look at specifically the binge drinking rates um, and some of the, the, the driving under the influence rates. And that's where we can really see some, some harm. 32.5% of 12th grade students in our district engaged in binge drinking two weeks prior to, in the two weeks prior to taking the survey. And 19.5% of our 12th graders reported driving after marijuana use in the past year. Um, so these are pretty significant risks that students are taking. And it's definitely worth us taking a step back and really considering um, the risk involved in marijuana and alcohol, especially for our young people. This looks at the access and willingness to use alcohol, marijuana, and prescription drugs. Based off this data, we can tell that students in our community are generally more willing to try alcohol and marijuana before they're 21. A lot of times this willingness to use is affected by what they observe in their community and the perception of risk um, that they, they have. So we'll look at perception of risk in a, a few slides, but um, we can also see that students indicated that prescription drugs are relatively easy to access in our community. And that's why it's really important for us to keep in mind proper prescription drug disposal, um, which is why New Hope Sobre Cares partners with the district, the local police, um, as well as the county to implement take back days twice a year. And the police departments have drop boxes for prescription drugs that are expired or unused. Uh, so you can get rid of them and make sure that they're away from uh, prying hands or students that might um, otherwise use them for, for means that they weren't intended for. This one looks at, um, again, their access, their willingness to use alcohol specifically. And we're trying to get at really where students are able to obtain alcohol, right? We've already seen that it is a problem for our students and the survey goes into details uh, for us as to where they're getting it. What you're able to see here is that mostly students are getting it by giving someone else money to buy it for them or taking it without permission. And you can see there, it says from my home, friend's home, store, et cetera. So basically stealing in general. Um, unfortunately, the survey doesn't do a great job of gathering data about where students are able to access marijuana. Um, but generally, we are able to see some of the same trends. And from our focus groups with students, we've been able to determine that um, students tend to share marijuana, uh, similar to sharing alcohol. So for instance, in this case, if a student were able to obtain alcohol from home or friend's home, then uh, they tend to share that within their social group. And then if another student is able to obtain, then that student will share it within the social group as well. Um, and based off of our focus groups, students have indicated that marijuana is relatively similar, that they share these substances within their social groups. Whenever someone is able to get their hands on it, uh, they kind of share it freely. And I just wanted to mention that these slides are why it's so important for us to properly store and lock up our alcohol in our homes. Um, a lot of parents, uh, you trust your kids, but uh, when you have groups of kids coming over your house, you're not sure. Um, and so it's really important for us to, to properly lock up our alcohol and uh, also our prescription drugs. So the next portion of the data we'll look at is the systemic factors. This one looks at community risk associated with the availability of alcohol. Basically, what we see here is um, that students reported that it would be relatively easy to get their hands on alcohol, which we, uh, we've already kind of seen um, and we've already looked at you know, how students are able to obtain. And they also report that if a student drank alcohol, he or she would not be caught by the police, or at least that's their perception, right? So 79.1% of our students are indicating that they perceive that they would not be caught. And so if there's a low risk, um, obviously it's a little bit easier for them to make the decision uh, to engage in this risky behavior. 
Again, we're looking at students' beliefs here. So this is favorable attitudes toward drug use. As you can see, a large percentage of students do not believe it's wrong for students to use marijuana or to drink alcohol regularly. So again, this is their perception. So they're saying, I don't think it's wrong for someone my age to use marijuana or to drink alcohol regularly. So you see 39.8%, which is nearly uh, a little over 10% higher than the state average of our students said that they didn't think it was wrong for students to use marijuana. And 21.8% said that they didn't think it was wrong for someone their age to drink alcohol regularly. Again, higher than the state average there. We also see their perceptions related to adults and whether or not adults would think that it's wrong. And this question in particular is focused on adults in the community. So um, it's not necessarily parents. There are other questions related to parents, um, but this one was, do you think your neighbors and community members think it would be wrong for students your age to drink regularly? And they said 22.9% of them said they did not think that adults would think it was wrong. And 17.7% .7 of our students indicated that adults in our community would not think it was wrong for students their age to, to use marijuana. And again, we're higher than the state in both of those categories as well. So um, this perception that um, it's that there's no risk and that there uh, that you know there's a acceptability from adults and from peers can contribute to students' decision to use. This next section is looking at antisocial behavior. And I just like to point out there, you know, there's a number of categories that the survey looks at, but I like to point out just two in particular um, that were high for us. So um, the 12th grade students indicated 15.9% of them said they'd been drunk or high at school, which is a, a relatively high number um, and when they looked at gambling lifetime use of or lifetime participation in gambling of all grades 46 percent of students indicated that they uh, had gambled in their lifetime so we'll look at the breakdown of gambling because we've been focusing a little bit on alcohol and marijuana uh, now we'll break down gambling a little bit just to um, better understand that so here you see, again, that statistic of students that indicated uh, that they'd engaged in gambling in their lifetime. And then uh, we have the, the past 30 days rate as well. And that's 11.6% compared to the state at 9.3%. So we are seeing higher numbers than state averages for gambling. And then they break down, they ask the students what forms of gambling they've engaged in. So one of the most prevalent ways that students in our community have gambled is through card games and board games. So basically, if they're with friends and they're playing poker, it's similar to our problem related to substance use. It's very social. So when students are um, in a social setting, they're more likely to engage in risk, um, gambling being one of them. So 12.6% of students also responded that they engaged in some other form of gambling that's not listed here. So we're not entirely sure what that means, but uh, it's worth mentioning there. Um, and I think as far as gambling goes, it's just worth us staying ahead of this. This is a relatively new question in the pay survey because it's a relatively new trend that we're following. Um, one thing that we have also been trying to follow is kind of the correlation between modern video games and its relationship with gambling addiction. Um, what is being studied right now is basically the, the uh, trigger, uh, the addiction trigger in video games, specifically video games that require payment for, or transactions for um, continuing to play. So uh, it's discovered that a lot of these games are actually building an addictive behavior because students are given a reward, um, short-term reward for um, basically for paying and, and they take a risk when they make a payment um, or purchase a new weapon or something in their game, uh, they take that risk and then they're, they are given a reward through the game. Um, so if you're interested in more uh, studying or looking at that more, it's definitely worthwhile um, because it's, it's kind of a, a new up and coming trend, but um, 
it seems as if there may be some correlation between uh, modern video game addiction and future gambling, gambling addiction. And this next section that we'll look at is related to community and school climate and safety. So I wanted to show both some of the positive and some of the negative. 82.6% um, of our students felt that there are lots of chances to talk one-on-one -on -one with a teacher, which is phenomenal. Um, it shows that our teachers are caring and they're making the time for our students. 76.7% .7 of our students participated in some form of school-sponsored activity, which is also phenomenal. And um, just to put this into perspective, in our line of work, a lot of the times these are the types of things that um, communities are trying to build up in their community. This is a strength most of the time. And um, unfortunately, many other schools don't have these strengths. Many other schools do not have high participation rates of their students. And um, our community is actually, it's very unique because um, when we go to conferences or go to collaborate with other uh, prevention coalitions and organizations, um, we say these statistics and they go, well, where's your problem? Um, but we have a problem, but it's just not tied to these particular issues that most other districts might be facing. I also like to point out the negative. So 27.7% of our students uh, feel school is going to be, is felt that school is not going to be important later in their life. Sorry, there's a typo there. Um, I'm sorry. 27.7% of our students feel school is going to be important for later in their life. Um, so basically it's a, a low number of students are indicating that school um, is important or they feel that there's value for their later life. Um, and 27.3% of our students enjoyed being in school. And this is a very interesting uh, thing to kind of juxt just oppose to each other because our students, they are very high achieving students they value, um, to some degree, they value having high grades. Um, and, you know, in our focus groups, we talked a little with, with our students about this because um, they feel as if, you know, they, they know that they want to get into good colleges and they want to get good careers in the future and they see school as a means of achieving those uh, goals. But at the same time, when they're asked these questions, they feel as if it's, you know, it's not going to be important later in life to some degree. So it's kind of an interesting thing. Um, and I would love for you all as parents to basically go back to your students and engage them in conversation about this. Um, it's definitely a worthwhile conversation because it's a very unique environment in our school district. Um, and your students are the experts. So they're gonna be the ones that know why this happens. Um, and you are the people that can get that information. So definitely I would challenge you to have that conversation with your kids about why they feel school may or may not be important um, and how that contributes to, you know, potential risky behavior or other decisions that they might make. I think it's also important for us um, to model uh, the importance of school in our community um, as, you know, parents or as community members to model for our, our students the importance of school and the value of, of work. Um, because if we're giving a perception, a negative perception about school or work or our careers, uh, then our students are obviously going to feel the same way. So those are just some of my thoughts when I looked at this data. Um, obviously, uh, I would love for you to, to engage your students and talk to them more about it. The next slide looks at bullying and internet safety. So um, what we see here is that overall 21% percent of our students indicated experiencing bullying in the past 12 months, but it is significantly down from last year, which is phenomenal. And um, I'm really optimistic when I look at these charts. I know that the district and New Hope Sober Cares, we've been working to address bullying um, for the past few years now, um, at least uh, that I've been involved in, and I'm sure the district's been working on it for a long time. Um, and I'm glad to see that those efforts are, are seeing a decline. Um, I can't prove correlation to any of the programs that we've done, but uh, it just it just makes me smile that I know that we've put the, the work in and we're seeing a decline. Um, it does seem also to have some sort of correlation with technology because if you look at the left chart and the middle chart, uh, the middle chart is inappropriate, inappropriate sexual contact through technology and the charts basically mirror each other. So um, I tend to think that bullying has a lot to do with technology use. Um, and, and there's 
plenty of research to support that as well. So again, another topic for you to engage your student in conversation over um, is, you know, appropriate use of technology and uh, maybe correlation to, to bullying. The next section we'll look at is social and emotional health. Thankfully, in this section, we are below the state averages. Um, I do want to say, however, that it's a serious topic, and I want to recognize that any student struggling with mental health is one too many. So for us, we can applaud uh, the district and our community for making mental health a, you know, a, a focus and working to um, address mental health concerns in our community, but we want to continue to work towards uh, healthier uh, mental health for our students and our families. It's worth mentioning that in our focus groups, students indicated feeling very stressed with their level of commitment. And we kind of talked a little bit about that already, um, where students have this, this high achieving nature, um, but maybe a low commitment to school, which may be contributing to that stress level, um, because it's kind of, uh, there's a tension in their perception, right? Um, they believe that to some degree, they need school and this commitment to school um, and this high achieving commitment uh, to get by. But at the same time, they kind of have this low commitment to school, which, uh, you know, when you hold attention like that in, in your belief system, uh, it can create stress for you because you feel, why, why am I doing this sometimes? Um, so that's something that came out in our focus groups. And I think it directly relates to mental health for students. Um, and also when we mentioned, you know, the, the times of heavy stress for students and their decisions to maybe engage in sharing, you know, Ritalin or um, ADHD medication, you know, that would be related to that, um, that mental health side, that stress that students experience. Also with suicidal ideation and attempts, um, we see that we are doing well as well um, as far as our state averages are concerned. But as I mentioned before, um, any student who is struggling with suicidal ideation is one too many. And so we want to continue to press this. And again, I would challenge you to have conversations with your children um, about this, about whether or not they know friends um, who have had any struggles related to suicide. Um, and you'd be surprised uh, the, the types of stories you might hear from your students about their peers and about the struggles that they're facing. Now this last section is going to look at risk and protective factors for our community. Um, before we get into the actual data related to this, I like to talk a little bit about what risk and protector, pr protective factors are because not everyone is aware of them. Um, we like to talk about it in a kind of comparison to something like heart disease. Um, if you were to think about heart disease as an example, I'm oh, sorry. If you were to think about heart disease as an example um, and you wanted to prevent heart disease, you would look at risk factors such as maybe a family history of heart disease, um, some sort of predisposition. And then you would also look at protective factors that can be built into an individual's life to um, help them to avoid having uh, you know, such a great risk for heart disease. Similarly, we can look at the, the prevention of a variety of risky behaviors at the community level. So um, we, we can basically look at what are the protective factors that if we uh, build them into our community, our community will be healthier and students will be less likely to engage in risky behaviors. And then um, also look at the risk factors, eliminate as many of those risk factors as possible. And a lot of the work that we've been doing over the past few years has been exactly that. So trying to find and identify protective factors that maybe already exist in the community and just make them more available to students. Um, and that's the partnership that we have with the district and a variety of other community entities because we're all concerned about students' health and we're just trying to make those protective factors as available as possible. And as you can see on this slide, um, youth behaviors affected by risk and protective factors are listed there. There's a variety of things that the protective factors that we are, you know, we're collaborating on can help to, uh, you know, help students to avoid. Um, the next slide here is going to basically what we'll do is compare the highest risk factors and the lowest or the highest pr uh, protective factors in our community. So this slide looks at the three highest risk factors for students. 
And those are favorable peer attitudes um, at a rate of 51%, perceived risk of drug use at 51.4%, and low commitment to school, as we've already talked about, at 63%. Um, I do like to talk a little bit about um, the, the legalization of marijuana issue at this point, specifically related to um, the the perception for students. So um, we have this perceived risk um, being a you know, huge risk factor for us and this perception of favorable attitudes towards drug use. Um, and as we've seen in other states, uh, when marijuana has been legalized, we see an, you know, this increase of or a decrease in this, the perceived risk. So basically when students are seeing that, you know, marijuana is being legalized, they're more likely to say, oh, well, it's not risky. Um, and it's, it's, they have more fav favorable attitudes towards it. So it's something for us to consider, especially right now um, in, in light of, uh, you know, kind of what's going on in our state and the dialogue there. I would challenge you to go home and have conversations with your kids about what they think about the legalization issue right now. Um, and I'd be, I wouldn't be surprised if they said, well, you know, it seems to me that, you know, marijuana is not that risky at all. Um, and that's definitely a point at which I'd have a, a conversation with them about the risks related to marijuana, um, for sure. And this slide looks at the highest protective factors in New Hope and Solbury. Um, and those are family attachment at 74.9%, family rewards for pro-social involvement at 66.5%, and family opportunities for pro-social involvement at 71.6%. So at this point, I like to just take a step back and say our families are really strong assets for our students. Um, and this is very positive data for us. Um, but what it also says is that we need to leverage the resources that we have. And if our families are one of our greatest resources, then really you all are the front lines for addressing these issues with students. Um, because if they really value their attachment to you and their time with you, then they'll definitely value your opinions and the conversations that you can have with them. So you all have the power to have these conversations and really see change in your student's life. So as we close the, the presentation portion of the evening, um, I just want to mention some of the things that we're doing again. Um, and this is, you know, these are things that we're doing in partnership with other community entities, obviously with the district, um, but there are other entities as well, including the library, the Audubon, um, you know, New Hope so Sober Soccer, uh, the police departments. Um, there are so many, Bucks County YMCA, there are so many people involved in, in these partnerships and these projects that we're working on. Um, just to mention a few, there's the peer education program that we've uh, established in partnership with the school district where we have uh, students from the high school and middle school going um, down into lower grades and basically being role models for students and teaching students about uh, healthy behaviors. We've also created strategic assemblies and educational interventions for students, um, social media campaigns, and we've worked together to increase protective factors such as the ones listed here um, below. And what you can do. So there are a variety of things that you can do. Um, we've already mentioned a few of them. Uh, I think the best thing that you can do is to educate yourself and start the conversation as early po as possible with your, your child. Um, you know, they say that five years out is the best time to start having conversations in an age appropriate manner um, related to risks that you think your child may face in five years. So I would encourage you, it's never too early to really start having those conversations in age appropriate ways with your children. Um, I would also encourage you to try to reduce the risk factors in your own home. So reduce access to substances, talk to your kids about the risks related to substance use. There's also a few programs that are out there that um, we're working on. For instance, the Strengthening Families program. Um, there are parent uh, seminars, and I'll show you a few of those in uh, the next slide. Um, and then there's obviously the next step, which would be to join our coalition and continue to collaborate as a community towards this goal, um, towards the goal of a, a safer New Hope and Solbury for, for our, our kids and our families and our community. These are some of the upcoming workshops that uh, will be available to you. And again, if you'd like to request more information, uh, you can do so by going to www 
www.nhscares.org backslash pays feedback, um, at which point you can say, I'm interested in more information about any of the things that we've mentioned. Um, and you can also give feedback about the presentation and the panel discussion for us, uh, which will help us to uh, craft our presentation and our panel discussion for the future. So this is that link again. And at this point, um, I am going to basically turn it over to our panelists. So um, I will be asking questions and moderating the panel discussion. Um, there are a few questions that are for all of the panelists, so there might be some dialogue between them. Um, and then there are some questions specifically for each individual. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we will basically, we will work through the questions as they've come in, and we will try to get through as many questions as we can before 7.30, at which point, for the sake of everyone's time, we will end. Um, if there are uh, questions that there were a lot of overlap in that were not answered, what we will do is try to put together uh, basically an FAQ document. Um, we'll, we'll engage our panelists after the fact, and then we will try to put out as many questions or answers to questions as we can after the fact. Um, but for the sake of time, we want to keep everything moving and close at 7.30. So again, these are our panelists, and I'd like to say thank you to all of them. Um, they're taking you know, the time out of their evening to be with all of us and answer our questions. Um, they're concerned about the prevention of substance use in our county and in our local community for many of them, and um, you know, they're concerned about our kids. So uh, just from the top, Executive Director of the Bucks County Drug and Alcohol Commission, Diane Rosati, is with us this evening. Uh, Bucks County District Attorney Matthew Weintraub, I believe, is with us. Uh, good. And uh, Sergeant Kevin Edwards of the Solbury Township Police Department is with us. Corporal Candace Tremblay of the New Hope Police Department is with us. Our Karen Rep and New Hope Solbury SAP Coordinator Gretchen Hagenbach is with us. Uh, New Hope Solbury School District Social Worker Douglas Ozuski is with us. And of course, New Hope Solbury Director of Student Services, Alyssa Martin, and um, also on our board at New Hope Solbury Cares, Alyssa Martin. Uh, so thanks for helping to coordinate this this evening. Um, so at this point, I'll stop sharing my screen and um, hopefully you'll be able to see our panelists here. And I wanted to start with, um, there's a general question for the panel. And so we have, uh, as I mentioned, about two to three minutes for each question. So um, in some orderly fashion, as much as you can on Zoom, uh, feel free to engage in this dialogue. So the question is, um, positive responses to the first questions on commitment and involvement in school have dropped. So basically um, that, that commitment to school uh, issue. It's dropped significantly since 2015 and are now far below the state average. As a parent and a school board member, that's a huge concern. How do we get to the root of that decline and work to reverse it? And if you'd like me to repeat the question, uh, I can. Um, Zach, I would like to go ahead and answer that as best as I can at this point. Sure. Um, you know, once we get the pay survey results and we start talking to our staff as well as our students about their perceptions of school. Um, one of the things that we notice is that a lot of our students are actually involved in many, many activities outside of school. Um, we are very blessed that we have a community that has the ability to get their children involved in swimming and horseback riding and guitar lessons, things that the school district doesn't offer. So I'm wondering if that in some capacity is leading to some of that decline. Um, but I actually completely agree with what you're saying. I think that's a good conversation for parents to also have with their children to find out why. And if there are things that we should be considering to provide in the district, we're always open into that. We have students that start clubs and organizations all the time. Um, so there's really nothing that's off the table. Um, so I would really love to be able to partner more with our students and our families to embrace the differences in the things that our children find interesting and see if we can incorporate that into the school community. Thanks, Alyssa. Does anyone else have anything to add? Okay. So I think that's a great answer. And obviously, you know, part of it was what I said earlier. So thanks for that. <laughs> Um, the next question that I have here is, um, I think uh, it's geared towards both Diane Rosati and Matt 
line trial. It says, how is Bucks County preparing for the proposed legalization of marijuana? And is there specific focus on the potential impact of our youth with legalization? Well, I'll lead off, uh, Zach. So we're not taking proactive steps because we, we've not received an indication that that is imminent. It may happen. Uh, if it does happen, I this is editorializing a bit. I, I think it's because it'll bring in some money. Um, I am not in favor of it, but if the law does change from strictly medical marijuana permission to general marijuana permission, I would guess that it will be uh, similar to the the alcohol law where the age of uh, permission would be 21. And we would treat it very similarly to, to uh, alcohol enforcement. Um, and I guess we're, we're all in a wait and see mode at this point, but we're not doing anything at this time because we have more pressing matters. Not, not that marijuana use among our young people is not pressing, but it's just not legal yet. So at the Drug and Alcohol Commission, uh, we are certainly aware of, of potential legislation uh, that we're hearing varying reports on where it might be going. And so we're beginning to think about what the community might do in terms of certainly our first priority is reducing access to illicit substances. Um, so it would be extremely concerning for us. Um, so to sort of get a, a bit of a head start, we've contracted with one of the providers who I know is on the call today, the Council of Southeast Pennsylvania, uh, to develop a Bucks County uh, marijuana task force uh, and they'll be eliciting some response from youth, from middle schoolers and from high school youth on direction that they might take in terms of developing policy and direction and getting some feedback. As you know, the folks that are most impacted are the folks that really should have some say. So we're trying to get a group together and I know the council will be promoting that very soon. Uh, we're very big supporters of uh, smart approaches to marijuana, the SAM group, and I would encourage any parent who's on the call tonight uh, to Google SAM, smart approaches to marijuana. They have some fantastic research and studies, and certainly Dr. Kevin Sabet is well known, and he's been in Bucks County and spoke with the school districts and law enforcement uh, over the past year, so we welcome his expertise but do have significant concerns about potential legalization. Thank you, Diane. And, and we're actually really excited because uh, we're working with uh, the council because we have uh, such a large student population that is engaged in substance abuse prevention work in New Hope. Um, so those students are actually um, hopefully going to be involved in the, the initial focus group for that task force, the marijuana task force. So we're really excited about that, really proud of our students. So thank you. Terrific. Diane, that. That's great. Um, the next question is for Gretchen. And the question is this, what is the SAP program and how does it relate to these survey results? Hi, everybody. Um, I, uh, I'm Gretchen and I work for Care and Treatment Centers in a capacity as a liaison to New Hope's um, SAP team. And really it's a non-disciplinary process. That's what a SAP, a SAP program is. And it utilizes uh, many people in the school community who then become certified by the state to participate in really what's sort of an early intervention on academic uh, difficulties, perceived academic difficulties, behavioral difficulties, where using observable behaviors, we can try to help the student before, uh, before it becomes too big of a problem so they can have success in learning. Um, and in the case of New Hope Solbury, I've found probably one of the most dedicated, well-prepared, heart in the right place group of SAP team members in, really in any of the schools that I've worked in. So um, that's basically what a SAP program is. And uh, uh, parents can certainly utilize it. Um, and we certainly need your help in these, these early interventions. 
Thanks, Gretchen. Um, Doug or Alyssa, do you have anything to add? And I would also ask too, maybe um, uh, someone can kind of outline if, if I were in the community, because I know that community members can put in SAP referrals. So if I were just a community member or a parent, how would I go through that process? <laughs> He can't talk. Thank you, Alyssa, for getting me unmuted there. <laughs> I wasn't able to do it myself. Um, yes, I've been a, uh, a member of a SAP team for over 20 years, and I feel that the supports and services that are often offered to students and families um, go very far for some students and then they're limited for others because then once they get beyond what we're able to do, it's in the family's hands to decide whether or not they're going to follow up with certain treatment recommendations or move forward with getting additional supports. But as far as the SAP team uh, in New Hope, we accept anonymous referrals from anybody, whether it's students, parents, teachers, community members, and we will then be able to take that referral, look into the information, investigate what's going on to determine whether or not it meets the criteria to move forward for an official SAP referral. If it doesn't, we look at what other things that can be put in place to help support the, the person who's in, uh, been identified. Um, but usually it's a starting point to get the SAP process moving. Thanks. Alyssa, anything to add? I was going to say what Doug said, so um, I agree. I think that anybody has the ability uh, to make that referral, a parent, a teacher, a student, a uh, building principal. Um, we've had great success. Um, Gretchen has been a wonderful liaison for us. Um, and actually in the past we had uh, less time and then last year we increased our SAP services to be able to support our teams and our students on a more regular basis. So it's been wonderful having her help guide us a little bit. Gretchen's great. Um, the next question is um, for, it's for uh, Corporal Candace Tremblay and Sergeant Kevin Edwards, as well as uh, Matt Weintraub. Um, the three of you uh, can, can chime in on this one. So the question is, would you explain the protocol that's used when the police department receives a phone call for a house party and kind of what that process looks like start to finish? So I can take that one. Um, so depending on what is said on the call, when the complainant calls in, the officer may actually call the complainant back and ask additional questions, such as how the person knows about the underage drinking party, how many people are supposed to be there, is a parent there? Um, those types of questions are something that we would like to know prior to arriving on scene. Um, when we get on scene, we will try to observe the residents to see if something looks amiss or is there extra cars in the driveway? Um, that sort of thing. Can we see anything, you know, from outside as to whether or not there's an underage drinking party? Um, and then the officers would then at that point knock on the door and ask to speak with the residents, the homeowner or whoever. Um, and then, you know, we'll ask if, if we can come in. We'll want to get the, take the names and addresses and phone numbers of all the persons at the party. Um, and at that point, we'll also ask for parents' phone numbers because um, we will make contact with all the parents uh, to let them know that, you know, we've arrived at an underage drinking party and that their child is involved. And then we will ask the parents to come retrieve the children at that point. Um, and then at that point, the minors will more than likely be charged with a summary offense for underage drinking. And if eligible, you know, we try to get the minors to go through a diversionary program such as the Youth Aid Panel. Um, you know, we're not out there to ruin people's lives, but we do want to let the kids know that, you know, it is not acceptable and that there are consequences for drinking. Um, and just to bring up another point, um, if the parents are home and allowing the children to be drinking, they can also be charged. And it, for an adult, so somebody over 21 or older providing alcohol to an underage minor, uh, they can get charged with a misdemeanor of the third degree. So it is serious. Um, we take it very serious. You know, we want the children to understand that drinking is not permitted and, you know, hopefully we can try to help stop it before it becomes out of control. So. Thank you. 
Kevin, do you have anything to add to that or? Yeah, I would agree with Candace that everything she said is, is correct. Um, there are times that we do go to parties and you see kids jumping out the windows, taking off into the woods. So in that aspect, you know, if we can grab a couple up, um, that's great. We call it, we, you know, we can call the parents. Um, if we can't catch anybody, we'll try and stay in the area as much as we're available to. Um, we'll, if there's cars, if there's an excessive amount of cars in the driveway or on the yards, we'll start running tags and, and then checking our database to see, okay, well, we've had contact with this car, we'll call the police parents and, and see if we can't get a parent involved to come over here and uh, see what's going on at the house, especially if nobody answers the door. Yeah, I'm Matt. To add to what Candace and Kevin said from the, uh, the prosecution standpoint, of Candace is right what she said that if parents are hosting if they're knowingly hosting even if they're not furnishing if they're knowingly hosting uh, we will prosecute them and we have because we need to make sure that our youth are protected a lot of times from themselves um, and uh, if, uh, if there is knowing use of marijuana at this point non-medical marijuana at this point go up and even a level higher to a misdemeanor one called corruption of minors which is an even more serious offense than furnishing alcohol uh the the other thing that i would say and i do believe in diversion but this is important for parents to know if, if your child gets uh, convicted of this summary offense of possessing alcohol and first of all you don't even need to have it on your breath or have consumed it if you're constructively possessing it if you're holding a beer but you haven't cracked it open or there's one in your pocket that's considered possession and you lose your license, you lose your driver's license. Even if you haven't gotten it yet, you would then have to apply successfully to get your license and then it starts out suspended. So we don't want that to have uh, happened for anybody. So we do encourage diversion, but I think probably you can only get one diversion uh, because we want you to be educated, your, your kids. And then after that, you're, you're probably going to get cited and have to either fight it or be convicted of that offense. Thank you, Matt. Matt. Could I just ask, because it's just for our knowledge in our school community, um, how often do you guys receive calls like that? Like that, I just think that's interesting information for us to know. Um, and if it's founded or not founded, just because I hear things, like I have people in the community that will reach out and say, wow, there was this big party this weekend. Um, so I'm just kind of curious to know how often you actually receive calls like that and what that looks like in New Hope or Solberry. In Solberry, it's believe it or not, it's actually not that often. Um, it has to be a neighbor. Like we have house, our houses in Solberry, they can be pretty far apart. They can be way off the road. So you can't see what's going on. The neighbors can't hear what's going on. So mm -hmm. it, it doesn't happen a whole lot that we get these calls uh, a ton in, in here in Solberry. If it's in one of our neighborhoods like North Point or Peddler's View, we're on patrol and we see, you know, 100 cars parked at a house at 12 o'clock at night. We may take a little, you know, look a little closer to see what's going on there. Um, but um, other than that, we don't get a whole lot of calls on it. I would have to agree. Um, in the borough, we don't get a whole lot of calls. I've been to a couple uh, incidences where we had, you know, multiple people at a party but I've been with the department eight years and I can only think of a handful of times that I've had to respond to, um, you know, calls regarding it. So if you're hearing from the community that it happens, you know, more often than we're getting called, you know, we're obviously not getting called for it. And we would hope that the neighbors would call. Thank you, that's so helpful. And definitely a message I think that our community needs to hear is that they should be calling if they're seeing this down the street or at a neighbor's house. Um, most people had reached out recently more because of COVID concerns and parties, um, but I'm sure that some of their other concerns were, you know, drug or alcohol related as well. So thank you. That's good information for our community to have. Yeah. Thanks, Alyssa, for that follow-up. That was helpful to, to us as well. Um, the next question actually is for, um, for Alyssa and for Doug as well. Um, 
so we kind of uh, I'm kind of combining a few questions that are similar. So there were a couple questions about the administration of the survey. Um, so I'll, I'll say three and then you can kind of answer them together. One, uh, is it still the case that NHSD does not survey sixth graders? And we've already answered that. So um, if so, are there any plans to include this grade level in the future? Uh, and does this lack of data skew the percentage results? Um, you can talk a little bit about that, um, how, you know, eighth grade sometimes pulls down the percentage as well. So um, if the survey is given, this is the second question, if the survey is given every two years to every other grade, does that mean some cohorts are never surveyed? Which is, you know, that's true, but we can talk, you can talk a little bit about uh, why that is. And why is the pay survey not administered to the seventh grade population? So again, that same kind of question there. So I'm happy to start, or Doug, if you want to start. <laughs> um, sure, I can start. I, I will answer a piece of that because I know there were multiple questions. Um, regarding the sixth graders, that is correct. We have not uh, surveyed the sixth graders. And I don't believe that it skews our data in any way um, for two reasons. Number one, we have never had a SAP referral or a uh, policy violation for a sixth grader due to some level of substance use or possession. It has never happened in my experience in the district. Um, so that was one reason that we were looking at that that wasn't necessarily an issue for the sixth graders. The other was in having students in sixth grade answer those particular questions, we felt that there was a lack of understanding of what the students were actually being asked by the survey. There was confusion on what was being questioned, they didn't know how to answer the questions. So we didn't feel like from a developmental level, the majority of the students were appropriate to take it because they weren't clear in what the end response was going to be. Um, as far as whether or not the sixth graders have any substance related issues, again, I, I don't know whether they do or not. I feel that at some districts, they still count sixth grade in the elementary levels. And, I, and for that reason, I feel it was somewhat a younger age to be soliciting and also giving them the experience into this world, seeing terms and understanding concepts of drug use that they may never have had before. And that would be a concern for me, giving them that this is their initiation into understanding some of these terms. Um, so that's, I know that's only a part of the question. Um, I forgot what the other part of the question was. I apologize. So Listen, do you want to answer it or do you want me to? Uh, no, I'm good. So the next part of it was um, that it is a given every other year and then therefore we miss cohorts of children. And yes, um, that's done by the test. Um, like production. Um, they have put that test out. It started in 1989. It is given every other year um, on odd years. So yes, there are cohorts of children that are not sampled, but the, de the data that we're getting is consistent cohorts then. So it's showing usage over time. So it is meaningful. Um, seventh grade is not one of the grade levels that the test company had decided was going to be appropriate. So they are not included in it. Um, in addition to what Doug was even saying about sixth grade, I would be a little bit concerned that if we tested the sixth grade, I think that was piece, a piece of what you're getting at Zach, that if we tested sixth grade, it may skew our data lower because we may get a lot of answers from students that know they don't use it, know they don't know what it is, never used in a lifetime, and I don't think that we would get a true picture of the actual uses that's going on as per what Doug was saying is as a district and Doug has been here 15 years, I think, he's never seen a sixth grader with those needs. So I think that we're capturing a clearer picture of our children by administering it to grades eight, 10 and 12. Thanks, Alyssa. You're welcome. And Doug. Um, the next question is, it's, uh, it was directed at Diane, uh, but I also think that if Gretchen, you want to chime in as well, um, I think you might have some feedback, but you know, Diane can answer first and Gretchen, you can collect your thoughts if you wanna respond as well. So the question is, how do the students in New Hope Solbury School District uh, compare to students 
in other Bucks County districts. And that's why um, Gretchen, maybe not Bucks County, but generally since you work elsewhere, you maybe be thinking about how you think the school compares. Um, and Diane, if you can respond first. No, I think it's a great question. So thanks so much. Uh, first, I would say, I don't think I got to introduce myself, sorry. Uh, so I'm Diane Rosati, Director of the Drug and Alcohol Commission. We're the lead drug and alcohol agency. Uh, we oversee prevention, intervention, and treatment programs. And I can tell you, New Hope Solbury is special. I've not had a chance to participate in this forum uh, on a PACE survey with any other district. So thank you for doing this and thanks for recording it. I know there'll be parents who didn't get a chance to participate tonight that will be able to later on and your faculty as well. Uh, so we, we uh, serve the entire county. So before I talk a little bit about New Hope Solbury's response versus county, I did want to swing back to the other question, which we do hear on occasion from districts in terms of what's, what grade levels are surveyed. And so in our role, um, we're really bound and determined to encourage districts to reconsider the sixth grade surveys. Um, I completely understand what Alyssa and Doug, what you are both saying in terms of you haven't seen kids yet, you're kind of concerned that it'll elicit some new responses. Uh, but as a general preventionist at heart, uh, and I know that we have preventionists on the call and certainly um, interested in, in this work, we know that there's a foreshadowing on early intervention and knowing sort of what the trends are gonna be. Your data, and you depicted it so beautifully, Zach and, and Sarah too, in terms of the charts and the graphs and seeing the progressions, I do think that, you know, as sort of a homework assignment for us, we'll, we'll connect with you again and talk a little bit about how we can work with you to adapt to perhaps a sixth grade. So I did want to say that um, it would be irresponsible of me not to do that. So I did want to just throw that out. We're happy to work with you and provide whatever education you need to, to move it along to that level. But I will talk just for a minute about your alcohol lifetime use, alcohol 30-day use, marijuana lifetime use, marijuana 30-day use, and vaping or e-cigarettes. Um, the, the bottom line, and I know if I'm a parent too, and I know you want to know the bottom line as a community member and a faculty member, uh, is that the New Hope Solbury data uh, has lower, has higher percentages in just about every category than the rest of the county school districts. So that's an important take home message in terms of, as Zach mentioned early on, so what do we do? How do we educate folks? So it's important to know what the landscape is. So in terms of alcohol lifetime use, use at all, for all grades, there was a 51.5% response, positive response. And for the county, it was 40%. For 12th grade, again, alcohol lifetime use, 76%. And for 12th grade, the rest of the county, 65%. Alcohol 30-day use just in the past 30 days, what students are reporting in all of your grades, 26% use. And the county, 16%. In, again, alcohol use, 30-day, 12th grade, 48%. 12th grade, rest of the county, 34%. Uh, marijuana lifetime use, New Hope Solbury, all grades, 27%. All grades, the rest of the county, 18%. Uh, marijuana use, 12th grade, lifetime, 54%. 12th grade, rest of the county, 44%. Marijuana 30-day use, all grades, 22%. All grades, the county, 11%. It's a doubling. Uh, 12th grade marijuana 30-day use, 40%. 12th grade, rest of the county, 26%. And finally, vaping and e-cigarettes, really an important issue, as you've already said, 30-day use. Uh, all grades, New Hope Solbury, 20%. All grades, county, 16%, a little bit closer, right? And uh, vaping and e-cigarettes, a 30-day use for 12th grade, 38%. And 12th grade county is 33%. So I just figured I would share with you what, as you'd asked, um, how you sort of stack up against the rest of the county in some of those areas. Those are some key areas. You have a lot of protective factors and strengths that you already shared and things to build on. But as a parent, those are important things to know in terms of the scheme of what's happening reportedly by, by the youth, 30-day and lifetime use. 
Thanks, Diane. Sure. Um, Gretchen, did you have anything that you wanted to add? Oh, I don't like not being able to unmute myself. It's good for me, it's good training. Um, Diane, thank you so much. That was very thorough. Uh, I will say Diane has her finger on the pulse of Fox, which is so valuable. I have a little bit of a finger on the pulse of all the counties around it. Um, all the counties that Karen Treatment Center provide SAP services to and of, you know, Montco and Berks and Lancaster and all the, you know, Chester, Philadelphia, um, Bucks has the highest use of all the surrounding counties. And New Hope has one of the highest use rates in that. Um, so it's of concern, um, but it doesn't mean that it can't be tackled. And I think that on this panel is a really great combination of people whose hearts are in the right place to work with parents, educate parents, help parents deal with this. Thanks, Gretchen. Um, the next question is actually also for you. So um, you, you can just stay unmuted. Um, it says, what do you feel New Hope Solbury School District parents can do better to help prevent drinking and vaping? Um, and I think this is a question that Alyssa or Doug can also follow up on if they have additional points they'd like to make. Wow. I So I want to say that I would imagine that no one really encourages their kids to get involved with substances at an early age. And being a parent is really difficult. And helping children navigate this requires a special sort of ability to be able to be disliked at times, right? And that's really hard for parents. So Doug gave great advice in the beginning about talking to your children early and often and also changing direction if it's going in the wrong way. It is okay to say to a child, you know what? We've been a little loosey-goosey. And now that I understand teen brain development and that, you know, inherently substances aren't really wrong, but for teen developing brains, it's a completely different animal. It is unacceptable for your developing brain to be incorporating alcohol or marijuana, especially this beast that marijuana has turned into, a completely different animal, right? So feel free to change direction. If you're concerned, ask for help, simply. It's, you are the number one factor as to whether a child will decide to become engaged in substances or not, parents, period, not the school, parents. And that means role modeling appropriate behavior around substances. Um, I had a parent say once to me, you know, no judgment, I'm, I'm a recovering addict. I've got no judgment. But a parent was saying, I don't feel comfortable sending my daughter to college having her not know how to drink. I think I should teach her how to drink. So when she goes off to college, she won't lose her mind. God bless her. Of course she doesn't want anything bad to happen. Number one, kids don't drink with their parents the way they drink when they're not around their parents. Number two, she's already taught her daughter how to drink her whole daughter's life by watching how she drank. My mom was an alcoholic. She taught me how to drink. drink. So role modeling is also very important. Thanks so much, Gretchen. Uh, Alyssa or Doug, do you have any follow-up? Alyssa? Zach, I want to echo uh, Gretchen's comments as well. One of the things that we struggle with as a school district, I know that you and I have talked about this as well, um, just as part of our new Hope Solberry Cares Board, is getting parents involved in the trainings that we offer and provide. Um, there are many, many times that we hear that there's a need for parent training. We organize, we publicize, we do what we can, and then we have four 
parents or five parents show up. Um, so the more that we can have parent engagement in some of those trainings, um, I think the better off we are going to be as a community in supporting our children, learning the right and wrong behaviors that they should be engaging in. So it really all comes down to that partnership. As a school district, we are willing to do whatever we can to support our parents in helping their children. So I would love to see more partnership and attendance in some of those evening activities or afternoon activities that we try and schedule for education. But it's great that so many people are here tonight. So we're, we're very excited about that. Um, Doug, did you have any follow up there? The only other thing I was gonna mention is I feel that we are very fortunate to be in an area and have a community that support their kids. We have a lot of programs, we have a lot of resources, we have a lot of opportunities for parents to get their kids help if it is needed. I think the difficulty is that even with all of the recommendations, suggestions, the availability of resources, there seems to be a disconnect and sometimes a lack of follow through to actually access those supports for their kids. And I'm not sure how to be able to engage that portion. Uh, but there are many people who are very passionate about wanting to help and be there for the students and the families. And we have the resources for them to use. I just wish they would be more willing to utilize them. Thanks, Doug. And I feel similarly. I think sometimes, you know, there are so many resources, uh, it's hard to choose. And that's why we actually partner with the district on the community coalition. Um, so that way, all of these community resources would start partnering together um, and provide our resources in, you know, more uniform way uh, so that it's easier to access them as a, you know, as a parent or community member. Um, you know, you can, you can ask one entity and they're able to point you to all of the resources that make sense for you. Um, so, yeah, thanks. Um, the next question is again. I think people uh, they they uh, they didn't know which police department to ask, so they've included both of you, uh, Corporal Tremblay and uh, Sergeant Edwards. Um, and Matt, you are also in on this question. The question is this: Are vape shops monitored for underage traffic? And are there penalties for underage pur purchasing? So if you could talk through um, any wisdom that you have there um, uh, on underage purchasing or sale at vape shops. I can uh, answer that. So uh, the compliance, compliance of uh, vape shops and tobacco sales actually falls under the PA Department of Health, and they have a division of tobacco prevention and control. Um, so they're the ones that they go out and they'll do the compliance checks uh, to the to the stores, to the vape shops, because uh, they get their and they get their funding through the um, through the FDA to do those compliance checks. So it actually falls under um, under them to do that. Now the Crimes Code does allow us to stop kids from purchasing or attempting to purchase tobacco products um, and that can, and the fines for that not the fines but the penalty for that so if we stop somebody uh, at the Wawa trying to buy a pack of cigarettes and they're under underage we can we can issue them a citation and then the penalty would be could be 75 hours of community service uh, and a, a compliance class uh, or a to complete a tobacco prevention class, all the way up to a, up, up to a fine of two hundred dollars, but the main area of enforcement of that is really it falls under the PA Department of Health and the Division of Tobacco Prevention and Control. Thank I'd like you. to, uh, I agree with Kevin, but I'd also like to say this: uh, I've, I've participated in a panel very similar to this. I think it was in Ben Salem. And somebody mentioned, well, we know of a particular shop that that we know for a fact, the parents said that, that kids were going in there because the vapes were very accessible. And uh, I, I spoke after that, and I'll make the offer now, and that's why I'm bringing this up, afterwards to Ben Salem Police and said, I'd like you to sit on that shop. I'd like you to monitor that shop uh, for a week, see what you see. And uh, they did. And uh, th th they were able to complete the investigation and with success. So 
uh, I, I never want to flip this back on the, the parents because it's, it's our job to enforce the law and protect everybody, but you are our eyes and ears. So if, if this questioner does have a particular shop in mind that they know is uh, what I would call an attractive nuisance where kids can come in and get their vape, vape supplies, uh, we, we want to know about it. You can, you can let me know. You can contact New Hope, certainly. You can contact Solberry, certainly. But you can let me know. You can do it anonymously at bucksda.org and say, I know kids are going in there. And then uh, I promise you, I, I will do my best to set up some kind of a, a surveillance. If I have to contact uh, the state, then I will. Or if I, if I work with the locals, that's, that's how we, gotta, we have to attack this from all sides. Yeah, I would agree. And if the person wants to stay anonymous, you can always go on to Crime Watch. I know New Hope has a page and the um, Solberry has a page and the uh, district attorney also has a page. So you're more than welcome to go on and do it anonymously as well. But yes, we definitely want to watch and make sure that the purchases aren't being made. Thanks. And you know, what's interesting, based off of the data that we have, as well as um, I think the focus groups that we've done, a lot of students indicate that they're giving money to older students to purchase uh, these products. And so to some degree, it's, it's kind of hard for you all to do your job then. Um, because, you know, it's not actually the, the student, the underage student who's making the purchase, right? Um, so that's a challenge I think we have in our community. The next question that we have is for Alyssa, um, and it's a, a long one, so bear with me. Um, it says this, as we all know, there is a proposed state law, HB 2873, Save Students Act, mandating mental health education in schools. NAMI Bucks County has an evidence-based mental health education and suicide awareness program, ending the silence, which is no cost to any student in Bucks County. How can NAMI Bucks County gain better access to presenting, especially since COVID-19 has increased feelings of isolation, depression, and anxiety? NAMI Bucks County has added a youth connection group that meets weekly on Zoom. Thank you. That was a good long question. Um, so yeah, we actually very much value uh, the partnership that we've had with NAMI over the last couple of years. They have been coming into our schools, um, working specifically in our middle school uh, to start raising the awareness of mental health and suicide issues, uh, specifically with our eighth grade students. We've done it, I think it was the last two or three years in a row and had planned on doing it again this upcoming school year. I would be more than happy to have a way for us to figure out how to bring them in virtually if we could. Um, in addition to that, I recently made a connection with um, one of our new community members who works with the Youth Mental Health Project. And I actually tried to connect her with NAMI so that we could strengthen our forces and provide more support for our students in the area of mental health, as well as suicide prevention. So um, I would be on board as I know our middle school team and even high school team would be to continue that partnership and have them work with our students moving forward. Thanks, Alyssa. Doug, did you have any follow up there? Uh, no, I, well, yeah, actually I do. Um, one of the things that I'd like to say is I absolutely agree. I think right now the students are feeling incredibly isolated. There is an increase of depression and anxiety amongst all of us. Um, so of course our kids are gonna feel that way as well. It's interesting regarding having accessibility to services. I know that I can speak for myself and all the guidance counselors and social workers in the district who provide ongoing counseling supports or invitations to meet with kids individually in group settings, provide supports, and it's difficult to get them to actually attend. Uh, we have made many, many offers. Every day we're reaching out to students to offer our supports, to check in, to touch, uh, touch base, and see what we can do to help support them. Um, and unfortunately, they're just not showing up or attending as much as we would like. We even had our peer leaders, our student peer leaders, who focused their efforts in our ninth and eighth grade uh, students. They ran multiple sessions after school for all of the ninth graders to attend uh, to 
brainstorm, discuss, talk about current issues, whatever supports they could provide. And out of the entire ninth grade, the combined number of students that showed up were only 10. So I feel it's difficult to engage or get students to be willing to access the supports that are actually out there for some reason. There are a lot of supports that are available. Students aren't willing to take that step. I almost feel like they're, after being in school on Zoom sessions all day, they're burned out. They don't want to take another half hour to meet with an adult or be able to discuss what's going on because they just want to disconnect in some senses. And I know it's kind of ironic saying that because most teachers, most students never want to disconnect from technology, but this climate is very different than how it was before. I think there's a, a excessive like Zoom burnout almost going on, which is preventing them from accessing the supports. Thank you, Doug and Alyssa. Um, I think this is gonna be our last question. There are a few other questions that we had and what I may do, as I mentioned earlier, is try to follow up with these specialists and try to get some of the answers um, and find a way to maybe uh, publicize the answers to the additional questions on our website, okay? So stay tuned. If you're not on our mailing list, that's gonna be the best way for you to find out when those are published. Um, so this will be the last question and it's for Doug and Alyssa. And the question is this, assuming drugs are often used to self-medicate due to stress and also knowing that NHSD is a high achieving, high academic uh, school, how is the school addressing student mental health proactively, not passively, while also encouraging students to take a heavy academic course load? Another long one. Yes. So um, I can absolutely address pieces of that. And I know that Doug will have some more specifics working with students directly, but um, in terms of mental health awareness, our curriculum starts um, direct explicit instruction in mental health awareness starting in sixth grade. Um, those units happen one per marking period and it goes all the way through the secondary level. Um, in addition to that, at our elementary level, both Mrs. Lang and Mrs. McGinnis for their guidance lessons work directly with each of the homerooms and they start introducing those topics to, those, to all of our students at a younger age, but more appropriate for their age group. So we do address the mental health needs and awareness starting from kindergarten and then all the way through to you know, our seniors. Um, it's a balance. And so what happens a lot is that I have to credit our guidance counselors working directly with students and families, helping them figure out course loads that will get them to their desired result after 12th grade, after they're finished with New Hope. But it's a balance of figuring out what is the right amount of coursework that's also going to help keep you as stress-free as possible because that's something that we all recognize our students struggle with. Um, we are a high achieving school district we do set very high expectations, both families and staff for the outcomes of our, our learners. Um, so I think it's a balance, but I think that our guidance counselors work really proactively with our families and individual students to build those course loads that have that balance. Thanks, Alyssa. Doug, do you have any follow-up? You have one to two minutes. Sure. Um, I feel that when we are actually in person in school, the strong majority of my day every day is meeting, providing counseling support, mental health support for our students. Is there an increase in depression and anxiety going on? Absolutely. I feel we do everything we can to help support these students and being available to them to meet their needs, to make recommendations for ongoing treatment. Um, but it is a concern I think that we're all facing. The increase is going to be significant and it's gonna be draining on many districts to provide supports to meet those needs. Thanks, Doug. Thank you for your brevity too, that was perfect. So um, that was our last question. Like I mentioned, um, any other questions that we have here, we'll, we'll seek out answers and we will publicize through our email list. Um, the answers to those questions. Um, I would like to thank everyone for your participation. And I really love um, the, the, the basically what Alyssa was saying about the partnership element. And I think that's really evident in the panelists that we have here and the, the 50 some odd people who are listening in our community. Um, 
that is exactly our mission at New Hope Silbury Cares, and we so appreciate the the level of commitment that we have from our community um, to partner with us to provide us, uh, you know, all of these prevention initiatives and to work together to a safer and healthier community. So thank you all for participating. Thank you to all of our panelists. Um, and I, I wish you all a good night. <laughs>